Hello and welcome to Meet the Author. I'm your host, Ken Marks. This is not just an interview, it's a conversation and our audience is part of that conversation. Meet the Author is brought to you by the Institute for Global Transformation. And we're a nonprofit, all volunteer organization. Our vision is a world working together to utilize the power, love and wisdom of higher consciousness to benefit humanity and the planet. And our mission is to support transformations in consciousness and in the way humanity interacts with one another. So as to bring about positive change in the world individually and collectively. We're very happy to announce and invite you to come visit our new website. And you can find that it's all one word, theglobaltransformation.org. And we'll post that in the chat shortly. Um, Come check out the new site. It's chock full of resources. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about becoming a part of our community of change makers, there's a join button on every page and that will uh, show you information about our membership options, which do include free options. And uh, if you'd like to support our work, including programs like this one, there's a donate button, which will take you straight to PayPal on every page. This program, uh, is being recorded and the uh, final version will be posted on IFGT's YouTube channel. So we also invite you to subscribe to that. And as you may be familiar, next to the subscribe button, there's a little bell icon. And when you select that, uh, you'll receive notifications every time we post new material such as this program. Um, because we also do have a live audience, as indicated, I invite our live audience to participate by either typing the letter Q in the Zoom chat if you wish to come on camera and ask your questions to our guests directly. Uh, otherwise, you can feel free just to type your question and I'll uh, get to as many of them as I can as time permits. So without further ado, I am delighted, uh, humbled, honored, proud and just uh, thrilled to introduce uh, this episode's guests, Dr. Raymond Moody and Mr. Sir Paul Perry. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, oh, and we'll be, we'll be discussing their, uh, one of the many books they've uh, co-authored. This one is, is titled Glimpses of Eternity, an Investigation into shared death experiences. And I probably don't have to do this for these two gentlemen, but I wanna read a brief bio just so I don't assume anything and, and certainly give them the, the credit they're um, well, well deserving of. So let me read a brief bio for each and then we'll um, get going with the, the conversation. So first uh, for Dr. Raymond Moody, uh, he is the leading authority on near-death experience, a phrase he coined in the late 70s Dr. Moody's research into the phenomenon of near-death experience had its start in the 1960s. The New York Times calls him the father of the near-death experience. Dr. Moody is a best-selling author of 12 books, including Life After Life, the seminal work on near-death experiences and reunions, which uh, I've shared a personal story with these gentlemen about, um, which has sold over 13 million copies worldwide. He has also authored numerous academic and professional articles on near-death experiences and the relationship of language to consciousness. Dr. Moody continues to draw enormous public interest with his groundbreaking works on the near-death experience and other transpersonal aspects of grief and the dying process, which we'll certainly be covering some of tonight. Uh, Dr. Moody's formal education includes a medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia and bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in philosophy from the University of Virginia. Uh, he, in addition to this appearance, uh, now on Meet the Author, Dr. Moody has uh, many, many media appearances uh, over his career, three times on Oprah and many other shows uh, a lot of you will be familiar with, such as NBC's Today Show, uh, The Donahue Show, Sally Jesse Raphael, uh, Geraldo and the Joan River Show, just to name a few. So, uh, Dr. Moody, welcome. And now to tell you a little bit about uh, our other guest, Paul Perry. Uh, Paul is the co-author of five New York Times bestsellers, including Saved by the Light, which is uh, one of the, the first 
best-selling books. It was written uh, by Daniel Brinkley and co-written by, by Paul. Um, Saved by the Light is uh, about Daniel Brinkley's, uh, at least his first near-death experience. I believe he's had four total, so he's kind of cornered some market. Uh, and that movie, that book was also made into a popular uh, movie by Fox TV. Uh, and uh, another bestseller that, that Paul has uh, written is Evidence of the Afterlife. He's co-authored five books with, with Dr. Moody, and that these numbers may be off now. You can correct those uh, once I finish the introduction. Um, their books have been published in more than 30 languages around the world and have sold millions of copies. Paul is also a documentary filmmaker whose work has appeared on worldwide television. His documentary, Afterlife, which is available at uh, glimpsesofeternity.com and also on Gaia, for those of you who have uh, access to, to that service. Uh, and that documentary explores mankind's most nagging question, what happens when we die? Again, we'll be covering some of that this evening. Paul's current project in progress is Relic Kingdom, <clears throat> a limited series on the six most important relics, including the Holy Grail, the Crown of Thorns, and the Robe of Christ. Now to the reference to Sir, which I may be way off on. It may be limited just to, to uh, those from the UK or Britain, but Paul is knighted in Portugal for his film and book work, making him a chevalier in the Order of St. Michael of the Wing, the oldest order of knighthood on the Iberian Peninsula. He has an MFA from Antioch University in Los Angeles and is a former fellow at the prestigious Gannett Center for Media Studies at Columbia University in New York City. He's co-written or written more than 20 books on a wide variety of topics, including biography, health, medical science, and history. And as I mentioned earlier, I just want to uh, say at the top here that um, there is a host of great um, video uh, references for both uh, Dr. Moody and Mr. Perry on Gaia. So if, if you have access to that and, and care to check it out and subscribe, I highly recommend it. Um, I, I watched many of these in preparation for this uh, program. And there's a, a wonderful series that uh, I think Paul may be looking into a little bit, but uh, it's a, a four part uh, documentary, but kind of an interview with, with Dr. Moody explaining kind of the work throughout his career um, covering near-death experiences and shared death experiences, apparitions and uh, reincarnation. So it's just a, a fascinating way to learn more about what this fascinating individual has done over a period of uh, 50 plus years. So without any further delay or ado, I can't uh, welcome warmly enough uh, Dr. Raymond Moody and Mr. Paul Perry. Well, thank you. That's Love just much. about all of our time today. <laughs> well, hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. And thanks to all the people listening in too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you yeah. as well. Um, I thought we could maybe just take a couple of minutes just to lay a little foundation for those who may not be um, familiar with the fact that you two have, have done so much work together. So if you could um, just maybe, Paul, if you want to start, just describe how you did come to start working together and then the nature of what your your work is together if there's more than than uh, simply writing a small library. Okay, yeah, jump in anytime you want to Raymond, but uh, years ago it was 19, what was it, 1988 Raymond? Eight. Yeah, I think it was 88. It was 88. I was editing a magazine in New York called mm -hmm. American Health Magazine. I was executive editor. And I was contacted by Nat Sobel, who was our book agent. And, and Nat said to me, I, uh, I have somebody uh, who would like some help writing a book. And I said, great, who's that? And he said, Dr. Raymond Moody. And I said, I've, I've never heard of him. And Raymond says, well, he's, he's the, the man who named and defined the near-death experience. And I said, I know very little about that. And, and he said, well, it's time for you to get educated. Uh, why don't you go down to Georgia and visit with Raymond and see if you're interested in writing a book? So I did. And uh, the book was the first one we finished, we wrote was called The Light Beyond. And it was a, a, a general view of, of uh, near-death experience research that had taken place after 
Raymond's first book, Life After Life. And in the course of finishing that book, I had a whole bunch of questions. And uh, one of the questions I had was, what, ha what happens to children who have near-death experiences? And, uh, and Raymond said, well, there's not a lot of research on it, but there's a guy in Seattle, Dr. Melvin Morris, who's working on uh, research on children and NDEs. Why didn't you go see him? And Raymond put in the good word uh, for me. And I went and talked to Melvin and we did a book together on uh, children and near-death experiences. And then Raymond and I, at the same time, we spent a lot of time talking to each other. And, and one day we were talking about uh, reincarnation. And we were both puzzled by it because it's easy to, to speak pro and con, I think, about reincarnation. And in the course of an afternoon of, of talking about it, we decided to do a book called Coming Back. And that was a book about uh, reincarnation. That's one of our books. What was the next one? The third book was... Oh, it was a while. It might have been Reunions, maybe. Oh, the third book was Reunions. That's right. And that was a whole other... That was yeah. another one of those times when I thought we, Raymond... We tried to do one right. on uh, the um, out-of-body experiences, remember? But oh, yeah. when we, they were just, it was just too vast. That's right. Yeah. But, uh, see, the neat thing about, from my point of view, how we work together is uh, I am, as everybody who really knows me well will, will certify, a bore in, uh, <laughs> in that I have such a narrow... Uh, my thing is, I'm sorry, folks, it sounds so dull, but ancient Greek philosophy, which yeah. is the most amazing story of history. And this is, I was not religious. I was, I don't know, it's a long story, but <clears throat> the idea of an afterlife was not in my world view. And I was, astronomy was my thing. And what got me interested in the afterlife was Plato, pure and simple. And um, <clears throat> because he immediately became, when I was 18 years old, my hero, first time I read him. And to make a long story short, the whole of the Western intellectual system, the everything you're thinking right now with the logic we use, is, <clears throat> came from these very small number of people there in ancient Greece who Put, put all this together. And you can't comprehend what they did unless you understand, number one, what we call near-death experiences, which they understood very well. Plato knew about them, and he took it seriously. You know, this is indicator of an afterlife. But Democritus, who came a little before, he, he talked about them too. But he said, you know, this everything is made up of these tiny little bits or too small to see. And one of these near-death experiences are it's just the, the invisible biological activity. He said there's no such thing as a moment of death, and this is just the residue when these people are brought back of biological processes, which is the same debate we have to get today. They also had a way that we're not as familiar with that they called oracles of the dead, and uh, Places where you went to um, to go through procedures during which you would seem to see and converse with lifelike apparitions of your deceased loved ones. I remember reading this in Herodotus when I was 18 years old and thinking, give me a break. I mean, I've, I remember thinking, yeah, even in my 18-year-old omniscience, I, I, you know, I knew that Herodotus had to, couldn't be right when he said they had this place where you could go and call up the dead. I mean, any reports it so matter of fact. But, well, years later in 1985, I read an archeological report on the rediscovery of this place. And just based on what they found there, I saw, oh my God, that's what they were doing. I set it up and it works. But see, to me, this the point of this is, these early Greek philosophers were specifically linked to these oracles of the dead. This is, there's a really great book. Um, 
I got to show this. Paul and I have the book Reunions. This one is subsequent. It's Princeton University Press 2001, which came out considerably after I was by uh, Daniel Ogden, who's a professor of classics um, in England, who the Greek and Roman necromancy it tells, tells this whole story about these amazing places where you went to call up the spirits of the dead. And this was, that's what the average person in ancient Greece associated with the idea of a philosopher. Well, it's a long story, but you see what I'm getting at here is, but this is not, and also reincarnation, Plato, before him, Pythagoras, all of these ideas were in the West from the beginning. It's not true, as some say, that the idea of the reincarnation came to the West in the 19th century with whoever it was, those people from India. That's just not true. Pythagoras and even before him and then Plato, they all, you know, it was reincarnationism from the very beginning. So it's just an amazing story, but see, you know, people are not going to listen to an old man raving about Plato. And, you know, this is, it's, and so what Paul does is very nicely, he can translate my rather abstruse things into a format where people will, um, can relate to it better, I think. So, and we just have a good time. I mean, he looks at things with this fine arts and journalistic perspective and my, uh, mine primarily with my uh, point of view as a professor of ancient Greek philosophy and philosophy of language and logic primarily. So. Yeah. And what's, what's interesting about all this is that, as Raymond says, everything we've written about has <laughs> in its roots ancient Greece. Gotcha. And and when you fit it into a book in the proper way, people realize that they're not messing around with something that was discovered or created in 2019. This is something that was that was BC. This is a very old bindings. Very yeah. <clears throat> and, and they had another way, by the way. They had the two the the two ways. Uh, you know, of going to the Oracle of the Dead and seeing the visions or the near-death experiences, which we now have in our society too. But, but they had a third one, which Ken can tell you about, which is down here in Florida. We are constantly living in fear of the ground collapsing under us and being whisked down into the underworld. <laughs> and and uh, in uh, ancient Greece, that was regarded as a life person, uh, you know, a possibility. People dreaded, ancient Greeks dreaded to go out in the forest. No, no, no. And then they were and stayed around the city. But, um, but there was a perceived danger that when you were walking out there in the forest, the ground might collapse under you and you could have a fall into the underworld. And if you recovered, you could go back and tell what people what you saw when you went to the underworld. Yeah, that yeah. Dr. Murray's referring to sinkholes and I live right. just a couple of miles from one well-known one in this area called the Devil's Millhopper. So oh. uh, <laughs> we, we try to stay away. But I, I want to use the connection to Greece and thank you for kind of letting us all know how your work together started. And then um, I would say a word to describe it sounds like alchemy um that that it comes together and but let's let's transition a little bit into the topic of the the book we want to focus on tonight this glimpses of eternity and talk about shared death experiences because I've, I've had the chance now to to read it learn a bit more about it um there's a gentleman named william peters who you may know that i heard interviewed recently who does a lot of work in this field but let's let's help others understand what the term shared death experience refers to and i thought maybe we could start if dr moody if you're comfortable sharing your own shared death experience uh, surrounding your mother's passing and, well, and as you describe yeah. what this means yeah, now I had known about this. Paul and I actually had been working on this for some time. And uh, we had talked about it from our very first book. We had, to, we yeah, had we talked about the case there uh, where a young army sergeant had a, happened to go into a, 
the hospital with a cardiac arrest at the same time that his sister, unbeknownst to him, was having, you know, dying in the hospital. She passed on. But in his out-of-body experience, he saw his, his, uh, his sister, right, who was diabetic or something. And uh, so he, he was out of his body and with, their, with his sister, he, he realized he was in the hospital without him. But then when he came back, he survived. And, it, you know, his sister had been in the hospital at that very time, unbeknownst to him. So, but it, I heard this from one of my own medical school professors when I was a first year student, but you know, we were actually working on putting this together. And then, and on around Mother's Day, 1994, um, I was working with a group of people and we were actually figuring out how to investigate this. This was psychologists and other people. And um, I made a phone call from the phone booth, as any young people won't know what that is, but uh, it's uh, to on Mother's Day, to my mother to have, say happy Mother's Day, to make a long story short, how are you? I'm fine. You know, yesterday I developed a rash. My brothers and sisters have taken to the doctor at the ER. Oh, nothing to it. Come back Monday. So this was a Sunday. And mom was fine, but she had a rash. She went back next day. Oh, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you have two days to two weeks to live. So in the midst of my studying this, my wife and I were there in the, in the hospital room with my mother those two weeks. And what can I say? It, it's uh, as she was dying, my wife, my brother-in-law, my sister, all, you know, kind of empathically participated in it. Oh, if you know, if you've experienced this, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, my perception was that I was no longer in a three-dimensional space. And I have heard this from a lot of people, too. I mean, and the people I hear from, it, to, it doesn't make any sense to say it, but it was as though the space around turned into a sort of funnel, like an hourglass configuration. And um, I heard my mother talking, but not through this. Uh, I, I just I don't know what else to say. And... and so, and, and uh, my sister felt the spirit of my father who had died um, 18 months before there. And so, but my experience is just one of, uh, I've heard just, I don't know how many of these hundreds and hundreds of people, all the things that we associated with near-death experience. Plus, as my mother was dying, I myself, I lifted out of my body, I went part way toward this light with her. Uh, or people say that as the person, in, as their dying loved one passed away, that the room filled with light. People say they see spirits of apparitions of loved ones who've already passed away, who sort of come into the room as though to escort the person away. And the most incredible one and embarrassing one to me of all is that have lots of cases of the bystanders empathically co-living the dying wife review of the person who passed away, which is uh, unsettling to me, to say the least. I mean, I, uh, I'm hoping to recuse myself from my own life review, much less the thought of there being a spectator there. But really, the most amazing thing about this to me is a way is that the bystanders, it's so natural. The oddest one of these is from some years ago, my wife and I got a communication from this doctor who was called to the ER to resuscitate a patient he had never laid eyes on. And he said, as he was trying unsuccessfully to resuscitate this guy, he said, the life of the person just kind of flashed up and came up around him. And um, so what, this is something that is a hard 
thing for people to deal with. I think that this has been around for a long time, but it hasn't been picked up by the public in the way that near-death experiences for. And, you know, that arouses my curiosity. Why so? Well, I think this. <clears throat> As I think about it, I got out of my body. I went through a tunnel into a light. I met my deceased relatives. I saw my life pass in review. I returned to my body and I came back to life. That's a travel narrative. We're all familiar with travel narratives, right? This other thing with people at the bedside, there is no simple narrative format to put this into any sort of I mean, what are we talking about here? It's the closest I can come up to is some kind of other zone or structure of reality kind of intersects. And these are hard, hard things to put together. Plus, it's easier for people to distance themselves from the idea of death when you're thinking about a near-death experience, because that's something that happens to this other person right who almost died and got out of the body so not to me but this over whereas people can easily more easily imagine maybe being there at the bedside of the uh, deceased loved one so for whatever reasons these are a harder thing to people to compute mm -hmm. plus we're very familiar with that way of arguing about the near-death experiences in terms of the oxygen deprivation versus the reality of it, right? But there isn't any format to process these shared death experiences. So, you know, it's, uh, but it's a really interesting thing. I mean, I, I know, look around and I can see what I can see over the, I call it my Edison here. I I'm kind of lost behind in the technology because my last computer broke last week. I saw the handle came off and I saw Thomas Edison's trademark under there. But uh, <laughs> with the, um, but um, <clears throat> this is this is something very important, and it's. There is no easy way to process it. It's you've got to go into some conceptual realm. And as many of us know, this thing that we're in is a narrative medium. Basically, people want to hear stories. And I've heard, you know, I can't wait to hear my next near-death experience narrative. Is, you know, after, after hearing thousands, but you know, at a certain point, stories are not enough. You got to have some concepts, and that's that's where this whole field is lacking right now. I think. I think the most convincing thing about a shared death experience is that it's an objective experience. So, uh, a a typical example of uh, a shared death experience would be a precognitive experience where you go to sleep at night, you dream that somebody, a friend of yours has died in some distant land. You wake up in the morning, you tell your, your spouse that, uh, that Joe died in China. And then later on, you get a phone call saying that Joe died in China. Uh, that's a provable experience, that's objective. A near-death experience is, is subjective. A person can have a near-death experience but there's no one there to share it with them. There's no way for them to prove that they actually had this near-death experience where it's entirely different with a shared death experience. There's always some information that comes out of a shared death experience that proves that it actually took place, that there was something supernatural that took place. There is such a, just a panoply of these amazing, things that take place during the process of dying, which are um, related more as family resemblances or like overlapping characteristics you can find. Like uh, one that I've been thinking about a lot lately, although I mean, this has come up for many years is um, just these fascinating cases of people who uh, 
as far as their family knew, had never had any interest in poetry, for example, or song. Will, during the last few days or hours or minutes of their life, um, recite poetry or sometimes make up poetry on the spot or sing. It's like two people in my association network. Um, one, a personal friend of mine from California. Um, it's like my friends who were there with her when she died said, as she was dying, she just broke into song and sang herself over to the other side. And uh, then a friend of mine, Jimmy, uh, his brother uh, had did the same thing. It just as he was dying, burst into song. Well, as soon as you start talking about this, you hear it's like um, it's it's it was one of the reasons it's so intriguing to me is that Plato pointed to it in his dialogue, the Phaedo. He's Socrates had always been kind of down on entertainment and singing, thinking it was just mere entertainment. But in the last few days of his prison, he was writing poetry and song. Mm -hmm. And uh, so his friends caught a call him on it. And he said, uh, you know, that maybe he's slipping right here, fancying himself a songwriter. But Socrates said, no, no, no. He's having dreams and visions to tell me to pursue music and he said uh, it's like the swan of the, the the song of the swans the greeks had a folk belief that just before people die they uh, sing the most beautiful songs uh, that just before swans die they sing the most beautiful songs and all so socrates was kind of analogizing himself to that i mean and and you anybody who wants to find cases of this i just heard from this a most amazing story of this young man from england a few weeks ago who was telling me that his father had died not long ago and that uh, and that in the process his father and they were kind of assuming this was part of the dementia or whatever, that one day the father said, let's sing that song. Day, oh, day, oh, whatever it is, daylight, come and we want to go on about the bananas. Uh, and so, so um, for apparently a period of time, the young man's father would insist the whole family started singing and all like, right? And so then on one day, the son went to his father and said, well, I guess we're going to sing that we're going to have a song. And then his father looked very sad and said, no, we're not going to sing that song again. We can't sing that song anymore. And so the next day they heard in the news that the guy who wrote the song had died. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, but see, the other thing to me that's so intriguing about this, that, that that has the exact structure of a shaman song, which consists of nonsense syllables and meaningless refrains, like hickory dickory dock would be a meaningless refrain, plus elements of intelligible language so that the combination is more powerful than either one alive. That was the formula of a shaman song. But also intriguingly, the formula, the formula for example, of doo-wop music from the 50s, sha na 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 get a jug, the meaningful and, and meaningless parts juxtaposed to create a, an effect. So what I'm getting at here is this is vast. The, Dying process um, involves music. Oh, people say they hear the most beautiful music they go. And uh, so all of these things, and it's the overlap, the, the swan song phenomenon, the near death experience, the shared death experience. We're talking about sort of inner overlapping and interacting layers of consciousness. Raymond's giving examples here of, of a type of, of a category of shared death experience called terminal lucidity. And terminal lucidity is when somebody who is dying and, and perhaps has no brain waves suddenly becomes very lucid 
they'll start to sing, they'll start to speak. Sometimes they'll get up and, and speak to their family like they're at a Kiwanis Club meeting. And, and the family suddenly feels that that person has revived oh, and that they're no longer ill. But in fact, they'll generally die within the next couple of hours to two days. And what is being examined now, even by the NIH, by the way, is, is that uh, terminal lucidity is an example of consciousness leaving the body, our consciousness separating from the body. And, and what you get is people uh, kind of reviving as they're dying, that their consciousness has separated and has now become its own animal, if you will. There's a number of cases Mm -hmm. uh, like the one Raymond spoke of, there was a woman named Catherine Emmer in, I believe, in the 1920s, who had never, she had meningitis as a child, had never spoken, had never gotten out of bed. And when she reached, I'm going to I'm, I might be wrong here, but she reached the age of about 28 or 30. Uh, she was dying in the institution she was in. Everyone accepted that Catherine wouldn't be there in the next day or so. Then all of a sudden, she, she had never spoken. She had never talked. She had never shown any signs of listening to anybody or learning anything. She started singing a song. And, and she, sung, she sang the song. All the doctors, everyone in the hospital gathered around her because she was someone they all knew. And it was a very moving experience. And then they thought she had revived but the next morning she died. And uh, it was her case and other cases like it that have really triggered this examination of this thing that has become known as terminal lucidity and examined it as though it's a, a possible example of separation of consciousness from a sick body. It is one amazing thing to see too. And as wild as it seems, Anybody who works with the terminally ill is going to see this. It's just, but the way you have to describe it just doesn't, it's, for example, they light up with a light. It's not they like do. a light bulb above me from the sun, but it's, I mean, you can only call it a light, but it seems to be from within them. And it's like they drop their neuroses. It is just the whack. The wildest thing. I, this man came all the way 20, 30 years ago from Australia to tell me about an experience he had like that when his wife was dying. And the transformation, he th this is what happens in the in the wars. You go in and the family, oh Dr. Moody, he's doing well. It's just like oh, he's turned around. Oh, he's, you know, they interpret it to be that uh, grandpa or whoever's going to get better is going to turn around. But then you quickly learn that, no, it, it signifies otherwise, as Paul was saying, that it means they're going to die pretty quickly. But this man from Australia, I remember the haunted look on his face and you know, he's trying to describe this. The, that just, his wife had been very ill, but he, he had to go to the store or something, so he sat down beside her just, but you know, when her, but he said she was suddenly transformed. He was thinking, oh my God, she's going to get better. They had this very deep conversation. So he came, when he came back to the store, she was dead. And, 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 and he said, I remember that look on his face when he said, it was almost as though she already had one foot on the other side. And that's definitely the impression you get that they are not quite tethered to physicality anymore. Ken and I actually had a conversation earlier today talking about physicalism. I, and he said he used to be, as a scientist, physicalist. I have never been able to make the leap to physics. I've just never, it's not that I, I love physics, I love astronomy and all, and I can think in those terms. But to me, it's always only been a way of thinking about things within a certain context. Mm -hmm. To me, the, the framework is much bigger, and it has to do, I think, where I've come to think at age 77 and partly stimulated by, before I went into forensic psychiatry, I did uh, geriatrics for a while, I had this, real, and during that year, 
repeatedly heard these very eloquent and accomplished and many celebrity type. This is a VIP clinic in a small town, like, and the chief of police, I, you know, the old reflective people, they're mostly because they were lonely, wanted somebody to talk to, uh, or situational stress. But, you know, repeatedly, you know, Raymond, the older I get, the more when I look back at my life, like it's been like a script or a movie or a drama or a play or a novel, they used to use different. But the whole thing is narrative consciousness. And if you think about it, your consciousness is narrative driven, isn't it? Like when something new happens to you, you automatically pull it into your life story. What, what are you except your story? And so I kind of think this is, to me, this is uh, like the movies, except very technically advanced movies where we can, we are embedded in the character. As uh, Descartes said, I am not, I'm not embedded in my body as the captain in his ship. By which Descartes meant that the ship captain may be in the ship and the ship goes aground, but the captain doesn't feel anything. But on the other hand, if you're out in the field and walking and you, you know, s slam your foot against a, you know, a rock, it, it's a different thing. But it's like now we're embedded in the movies so that we, you know, it's, uh, but in the end, we realize we're all the same character kind of is the wildest thing it's like you well, there's a, we live there's life other forward as the actor and then we is turn time stands still again we get to see the same stuff from the point of view of all the characters that's pretty wild <laughs> yeah. there's well, other types of shared, there's other types of shared death experiences or well as well that are highly visible and and some of the ones we've explored have been ones that involve uh, a mist leaving the body, which sounds very bizarre. But in fact, over the course of the last three or four months now, I've had several doctors tell me that they've seen a mist leave the body at, at the time that a person dies. Mm -hmm. uh, one doctor in particular uh, was in uh, Baltimore. He was a, a, a doctor in Baltimore, a hospitalist. And at night, someone said, you know, Mrs. Jones is, uh, is dying. She's, she has that racked breath that comes with dying. And so he went to see her and she had passed. He stood with her for a while to make sure she had, had actually died. And at that point, he saw a greenish mist leave her body and go into the air. And it was in the air in front of him and a nurse for several seconds, and then it dissipated. He said it, oh, it went into a portal that opened and this green mist fled into this portal. That happened to him twice over the next couple of years. And, and there's other doctors as well. I mean, I, I think, have you had the experience, Raymond? But, but there's other doctors we both know who have had the oh, same thing. I haven't, I haven't experienced that, no. In, in terms of a dying patient, see something, leave the body. No, I haven't. Although I have with a very eminent engineer and business professor had that experience. And it's, it's a complicated story, yeah. But I haven't seen it at death, but I know a lot of people who have. I mean, I just hear this. Dr. Hagen was telling us about, uh, we were telling him about these, he's a, a wonderful um, man in Kansas who's the, the editor of the uh, Missouri Medical Monthly out there, which is a terrific state medical journal, who was investigating this. And he said he heard about these uh, shared death experiences. Then he happened to mention it too. Was it his neighbor? He said, yeah, right. when I was a little boy, I saw, you know, you're just, as soon as you start talking about it and people are, well, you know, the ice will be broken and they say, yeah, it happened to me. It's, uh, I mean, Dr. Hagen was embarrassed to mention it to his neighbor 
That's right. <laughs> Abraham said, well, I saw the same thing with my, with, I believe it was his mother. That's I right. saw the same thing with my mother. I saw Miss leave my mother. And, uh, and the, the interesting thing about that is if you mention something like this in a group of people, I guarantee you that more than one, maybe more than five or 10, will have had an experience that's a shared death experience. They maybe have never spoken about it because they don't know what it is. They don't have words that can give it a handle, but they do now when you start to talk about a shared death experience. And I, that's important. And I want to, to make sure we spend a little time on the, the importance and the potential uh, effects that, that this information that you all have put into a book and Paul shared with me earlier that you're, you're writing a second book on this topic now. And I wanna, so I wanna explore some of what you think the potential import and impact could be, but I wanna start with a quote from, from this book where uh, Dr. Moody said, and, and it couldn't be more uh, on point than after a day like yesterday, frankly. Um, what the world needs now is an unexplainable mystery, one that offers great hope. With shared death experiences, we have such an astonishing phenomenon that is verifiable by almost anyone who honestly examines, it yet is even more difficult to explain and it's more familiar cousin, the near-death experience. And so I wonder, what do you all think? Is there some larger purpose to your work, like helping teach all of humanity more about the true nature of our existence? And, and do you well, see a connection to the work and, and humanity's evolution? Well, then let me quote Dr. Jeff Long, who I co-wrote Evidence of the Afterlife with. And uh, what Jeff says is these, these, these things, these events are smarter than the researchers. And, and that's one thing you have to look at when, when you look at shared death experiences and the different categories of them is that we can find them, uh, but we can't explain them, generally speaking. Can't, can't explain, but do you, do you think we are nearing answering the age-old question, what happens when we die and, and is there an afterlife or life after death? I am convinced that we are at the point where if we wish, we can actually solve the major real problems that hold us back. And that is, um, you would be, familiar Ken with David Hume since uh, Einstein was influenced for example by David Hume and and um, David Hume was the archetype of the skeptic and when he was asked about the afterlife problem he said and if you follow these words as I say them you'll see he was right he said by the mere light of reason, it seems difficult to prove the immortality of the soul. What an understatement, right? <laughs> he went on to say, some new species of logic is requisite for that purpose and some new faculties of the mind that they may enable us to comprehend that logic. And that is the reality. To get down to the basics of it, because logic doesn't operate with self-contradictions. And the notion of an afterlife is a self-contradiction, right? So, I mean, it's an enormously complicated problem. But I kind of think that him, I mean, he was number one, he was right. But he was assuming that he, because he was right in his criterion, that his criterion is impossible to fulfill which is what the common sense view. I say, no, his, his, his condition is not hard to fulfill at all, that we can think about this in all new ways. And so what I'm getting at is, I think the really neat thing about the afterlife question is that it promises an actual enhancement of your human cognitive faculties. I think it can be done. We can't solve it with the faculties we got now, 
But I guarantee you, we can work on our faculties in such a way as we can make the problem actually more resolvable. So that's what I'm saying is that this problem, it, uh, I mean, this question opens up a whole new way to, for us to think about things. It's, uh, you probably read A.J. Ayer and all the logical positivists and all knew about that movement. And, you know, they pointed out that, you know, in reality, the question of an afterlife is not, you can't verify it is the problem. But what I'm saying is we're, we're on the verge of being able to do that. I think that's the, I think that's the beauty of the shared death experience is that yeah. you can objectively show that there's been a, uh, some kind of survival of consciousness. That's my feeling about it. I, I don't know if Raymond feels the same way, but I think if, as with many things in medicine, the power of observation eventually wins out. And, yeah. and I think that with shared death experiences, we're, we're kind of there. We're, we're close. That's that's right. I think, I mean, it's, I absolutely agree. This is something that to be processed, we can't, we can't do it with the mind we have. Right. Well, I agree, <laughs> we I agree with work that. on our mind. That's right. And I, th I think it can absolutely be done. I just think that uh, it's, I mean, it's I was talking and earlier and then and, and I, I said that well so many people think near-death experiences for example are foolish until they have one and then they're completely obsessed by it and 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 looking for what it means and where it took them and where they might go when they pass on uh but these are objective experiences which opens them up to to many more people than near-death experiences do because Everyone can see a shared death experience. Everyone can see evidence of an afterlife through a shared death experience. One thing so interesting about these is people who have these kind of transformative experiences, when they come back, their experience, that what their experience does is that in, it imparts to them a standard of reality that is outside of the framework that right. the rest of us in ordinary consensus reality are in. So even after they get back from this experience, it's like that part of their criterion of reality is not within this framework that you know we're in. And, and as I gather, I mean, there's the ineffability barrier, but it looks to me like... Uh, it's um, that the time space coordinate system no longer works. And yet the, you can't put into words what the coordinate system over there is. When people do, it's like what they tend to come up with is that here is the, there's consciousness and then time and space, whereas they uh, that other state there's consciousness within a framework of love and knowledge. Is what people right. say. That that's your coordinate system. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's across the board. People who uh, have near-death experiences, people who have shared death experiences, suddenly become uh, more interested in love as as uh, than they are in money. They become less greedy. They become type A without being angry. Uh, there's a lot of big changes that take place in people through these experiences. Well, Paul calls the type A, I think that's interesting. It's like people say uh, a sense of urgency is what yeah. they should develop after a near death experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, a question from one of the people in the audience I think is just very brief back to this uh, idea of the mist that is observed uh, and they just wanted to know um, if, if it's always greenish in color. No. That's what I heard here. You don't right. think so. It's always yeah, it's different. People say blue or grayish or golden gray or gold. I've heard white and green. 
There's a. Uh, maybe. I'm sorry. Just I think you cut out. I said. Man, I was trying to make a joke there. I said maybe I'm colorblind. <laughs> but <laughs> no, no. I always hear gold. Well, I believe gold. in the book there are several accounts uh, speaking to this aspect of the shared death experience phenomena, and um, I believe the descriptions from these different accounts also refer to different aspects of different colors. So the, the, in the book, there are different accounts of it. Um, Marty is asking if you could repeat the definition of a shared death experience. And you might also, uh, Paul and I were talking earlier, one of the more compelling stories I found was about this woman named Olga and involved her son-in-law. And so maybe if you can weave those, those things together, kind of how you would define a shared death experience and then give the example of that story because it's one of the more compelling. Yeah, can Raymond, can you define yeah, the shared well, death experience? The, the way I think of it, for those of you who might have studied Wittgenstein, that's the way I think in terms of what we call, um, um, uh, he called it family resemblances, but it's like there's a group of characteristics, see, where um, if you look at 100 cases of shared death experiences, the features crop up again and again, but no one story may have each and every one of the features. But some of the features are um, seeing uh, the spirit, the bystander seeing the spirit of the dying loved one leave the body or the bystanders saying that they themselves left their own body and rose up part way toward this light with grandma or whoever, and then came back. Or people describing how the room seemed to be in some impossible configuration, like that they would say that they realized they were seeing things in the room for impossible from an impossible angle. Or people saying that they see the spirits of the dying loved ones, individual, you know, mother, loved ones who have already died, seem to be. They, and this is actually seen by the bystanders sometimes. The, their, <clears throat> the apparitions coming in, and up to and including, or all this light penetrating everything, and up to and including bystanders empathically co-living the life review of the person who is passing away, which is uh, a lot less startling in the living of it than it is in the telling of it. Because this is one thing that was fascinating to me is how natural it seems to the bystanders. Whereas to relate it, it seems something just so beyond extraordinary. But in the experiencing of it, it may, kind of makes me as a psychiatrist, I really, you know, everybody's got pretty much the same secrets or I mean, you know, but. It's, it's, a, um, it's a good reason if you have an interest or this conversation has hopefully piqued your interest to, to get the book. It's uh, one of the things that I knew when I, this, this came on our schedule and I would have the chance to read it is um, one of the, the gifts that the alchemy between these gentlemen produces are very well-written, compelling, easy to read books. This is not like an academic treatise that you have to learn a whole new vocabulary and jargon to, to follow. They do a beautiful job of illustrating um, answers to, to Marty's question through case reports with their interpretations and they're using them as examples to convey and make their points. And it's just, it's a, it, it is not a, a tax and read at all. It's gripping. It's, and, and to, to keep reminding oneself that it's, this is not a novel. This isn't science fiction. These are actual things that, that happen. And that's part of what I believe was being referred to earlier and having to adjust our, our mindset and to be able to kind of wrap our heads around the fact that these things really, really do happen. Um, I wanna be sensitive to your time and um, I absolutely wanna make sure that we give you all the chance to 
make sure that you you share with with everybody that is here tonight and we'll see this later on YouTube um, anything that we haven't covered because I came away feeling this is this is very very important work and it could be um, a huge game changer for for humanity frankly and I don't think that's an overstatement and so I want to make sure that uh, if there's anything we haven't covered that could could maybe speak to that a little bit or anything else I want to give you the opportunity. Well, personally, I just want to thank everybody listening in. I mean, these things are very challenging to me. I mean, you know, it's uh, Plato is still my hero after uh, 60 years here. And, uh, you know, he put a res, he said, you know, it's like realistically, he said, well, this is the most important question. But also, we got to be honest that these are very, very difficult things to think through. And these are big issues and we do wrong to ourselves and others if we try to simplify it. This is a very, very astonishing thing that, and there are no words for it to me, but to apparently quite a large number of people when they're there with the dying of them, they sort of put their foot over into another reality for them, which yeah. can change them greatly. He just reminded me of something else that I read that I thought was just very touching. Uh, something else you, you wrote, there's a section of the book where you acknowledge that some people will be very motivated to seek and receive an explanation for these phenomena. And you say, Dr. Moody, that you've learned to just accept the wonder of them and not have to explain it. I thought that was beautiful. Well, because, because, to be honest, our, our conceptual equipment is not up to the question of life after death. But that means, it, it's like Plato acknowledged that and he said, no, we can't stop. He said, it's the most important question. And it really is. And, and so that's why I just keep working at it. Yeah. Paul, anything else that, that you wanted to make sure that, that we, uh, you, you'd share with us? And we take away. Well, I think reading about shared death experiences or even having them uh, require a breakthrough of, of, of a wall of, of form of, of belief. You have to break through this wall of long held belief and and take yourself farther. It's it's difficult to go further. It's difficult to break through your your the beliefs that you've had all your life, but it's certainly worth it. Uh, in many ways, it's like studying the universe. There's so many things in the universe that defy laws of physics uh, that we just have to accept them, black holes and, and, and uh, other things that are out there in the deep universe. And this is the deep universe of man, and you have to break through it and realize that there's things we don't understand, but there's, there are things that are worth pondering. And by doing that, it improves us it doesn't negate us. Yeah, which is which is huge. It is huge. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll share also another aspect of how the work has touched me, and I've heard other people say this. So I just I want to make the point that it's not it's my experience, but I think it's worth sharing. And that is um, that this reading about and and hearing and watching. Uh, stories about near-death experiences, share death, reading your work, it can have a tremendously consoling and comforting effect um, for those who have, have recently lost a loved one or may be uh, experiencing uh, the, the terminal illness of a loved one to, to especially if you don't have uh, the, the background of faiths, let's say, that you could, could lean into to, to have the opportunity to truly see proof in my mind that there is some, some other part of your loved one's existence that will go on. And, and yes, you'll grieve and the form they're in, you will miss and they'll be gone, but there's some aspect that, that goes on. I have found that very, very comforting and consoling. And I wanna offer that as a thank you to you for, for doing that because it's a tremendously 
healing uh, part of the work as well. And, and I want to just make that point and thank you again. Well, thank you, Kevin. Marianne Miller, our uh, founder and president, has shared in the chat that uh, when we learn to expect this, I think the, the, this phenomenon, basically, uh, I think we'll experience it more often, and I couldn't uh, agree more. I think it will become kind of common. IFTT focuses on uh, a phrase we call the, the tipping point, where there will be a critical mass that these, where these are no longer conversations like this won't happen because they'll just be matter of fact. Uh, and there will be some. And the new world opens up. Yeah. Once you get to that tipping point, a new world opens up. Right. So, uh, and this, I do think this is the kind of work that helps really advance it because it, it, you know, kind of helps bridge that gap from something that seemed completely uh, something about as a matter of faith, unless you experienced it. And now it's the proof is, is here and it just needs to be conveyed to more and more people uh, to eventually it becomes commonly understood. But I want to thank you so much again, um, personally for the conversations earlier and tonight on behalf of IFGT, on behalf of, of humanity for your work. And uh, it's fascinating. And thank you for, for sharing all of the alchemy with us. Thank you. Well, very thank much. you very much. Bye. Take care. Yeah. Right. Thanks so much. Good night. Be in touch. Thanks. Thank you.